I am James Silverman. I'm here with Russell Hunter and Sam Riley. Mm-hmm. Today, we are going to be talking about legislation and legislators. Uh, but first... Again. Again. Again, because it's important. I guess we do that yeah. a lot, don't we? Yeah. I mean, we are a legislative organization. We're lobbyists. Yes, it makes sense. But it's not going to be just a retreading of some old things, no. but it's going to be it's some old things now. that are wow. happening now. Because big time elections coming up, we so will retread that. some things that need to be retreaded. Yeah, retread. Yeah. But yeah, but first, uh, this is the uh, final episode of October, and every final episode, we give a piece of original artwork t- away to one of our supporters. So that's any Free the States monthly supporter, and any Free the States uh, donor who gives sort of. A good generously. amount. Generously. <laughs> and generously is defined as, you know, decently. I don't know. We just put, if you give to Free the States, we put your name in this bucket, yeah. basically. Um, and so, yeah, we do a drawing. And I wasn't actually here in uh, studio. Or I wasn't in my office the week that you guys sort of said, hey, this is the next piece of art. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm wondering if we can get a good enough shot of this. But um, for those who can see, you're looking at this. It's, uh, it says Free the States. And you've got uh, a dragon, and you've got uh, a young man on a horse with a sword, and he's in a t-shirt, and you're like, what the heck? And it says, the Liberator down here. Um, And when y'all said, hey, we're going to do this, you didn't really say it. You just said, hey, there's like a drawing, and there's a dragon, and Russell's crazy. Well, you had put it out on the set, and so we thought, this must be the artwork that Russell wants to give away, so. Yeah, no, no, which is perfectly cool. (laughs) Now, technically, it wasn't a piece of art that I wanted to give away, which is interesting because we're going to give it away because we said we're going to. Yeah. The, the thing is, is we were filming something else and there's this sort of, you can't really see it, but there's a, there's a letter that we have kind of on the wall here in the set. And it's, and it's actually a handwritten um, speech that Dan Fisher wrote that he gave, he gave this speech out in front of an abortion clinic during his campaign. And he gave me the, the speech and I framed it. Uh, But it doesn't look very good. So I was just kind of like, it's just like this white block on the the shot. So I just kind of haphazardly was like, oh, this is a dragon. Dragons are cool. And I put it in front of there. And then I like went out of town or something. Or I just got busy on something. And then you guys were like, oh, I guess this is the piece of art that we're giving away. So this is the piece of art that we're giving away. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, I'm very fond of this piece of art. Um, but so they very peculiarly named dragon. If you look at it, it is, uh, the abortion dragon. Oh, <laughs> his name is Aborton. Aborton the dragon. Aborton the dragon. <laughs> <laughs> it was about, what is this? Probably three, three, four months. I'm yeah. coming in here. It's, it's late. It's like 10, 11 o'clock. I'm just coming in here to tell you I'm taking off for the night. Yep. And uh, I take a look at the, the art you're drawing. I'm like hunched over and I'm yeah. drawing this thing. I've probably been, I don't know how many hours I've been working on it. Yeah. But it's in pen and ink. You know, it's very. You see, you'd like to say that it was just a typo, but that is hand drawn. <laughs> yeah. It's not like I can just sort of like delete, delete, <laughs> add an I. But yes, it's the, uh, it's the dragon is supposed to be labeled abortion. And the person fighting the dragon is the abolitionist. And the sword is the word of God. And he's rearing back on his horse. And he's got his sword and his shield and his abolitionist shirt. And he's going to fight abortion. But it became Aborton, the dragon. And yeah, it's totally just, you know, I got to drawing and I didn't get to spelling. But the cool thing about this is that, uh, I mean, I... Well, maybe this is not the cool thing about this. The good thing about this is, is that the art has been digitally scanned and it will be used for the purpose. It's going to be for like a, 
a kid's shirt whenever we get our store together and we make resources. It's so kids can wear a cool Dragon Slayer shirt for Free the States and the Liberator podcast. And I will, through the magic of Photoshop, be able to get that eye in there. Um, but this original piece of artwork in all its erroneous glory is going to go to somebody and they're going to have it. And they're not only going to have some artwork that we've produced and used, they're going to have evidence that I can't spell forever. <laughs> Yeah, but awesome. some, some people might be like, oh, that's stupid. I, I got a, I've got a piece of art that I'm going to hang up, and it's going to be like just proof that Russ can't spell. But it's actually going to be worth more now. That's how baseball cards are, right? Yep. yep. The, the, the most valuable baseball cards are the ones with errors. Yep. And so this is the most valuable piece of art we've ever given away. Yep. Yeah. So at the end of this episode – uh, we are going to draw from our, our bowl of supporters and give this piece of artwork to one lucky supporter. Thank you to all the supporters, but one of you is more lucky than the rest of you this week. Mm-hmm. All right, so let's get to the legislation and the big election that's coming up. Once again, we're talking about the importance of legislators. Yes, and that's not the only role, right? Legislators are, are one role. There has to be agitators. There has to be educators. There has to be... Um, religious leaders who get involved. We all have roles to play. We all have very important roles to play. Uh, This episode is about the role of legislators. Um, And then later we're going to get into some specific legislative candidates. But for now, just we're talking about the legislative role in the abolitionist movement. And in the abolitionist movement, you need your William Lloyd Garrison's, you need your Thomas Clarkson's, but you also need your Charles Sumner's and you need your William Wilberforce's. Right. You need the person putting their name on the bill, authoring the bill, putting it forward on the floor of, of the Senate, House, Parliament, whatever it be. Yep. Um, you need those people and you need them to be able to defend that bill well. And so this this is an important role. Yep. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so let's, let's talk often, a bit Oftentimes they like end up being called in history like the champions of the bill. Like so William Wilberforce is probably – far better known than Thomas Clarkson. Definitely. Um, and a lot of people probably are like, well, I, I don't even know who Thomas Clarkson is right now. I mean, we've talked about him a little bit on this program, but Thomas Clarkson is uh, the guy who's really active in the trenches, getting people, you know, signing petitions, going, you know, going to legislators and saying, this is what we need, going to members of parliament. This is the kind of thing we need. Really stirring people up educating them to like the evils of, in his case, the slave trade. And so you you would say, you know, without a Thomas Clarkson, you may not ever get a a William Wilberforce. And without a William Lloyd Garrison, like in the American context, you may may never get a Charles Sumner. And so when we talk about sort of like the legislators, we want to be very, you know, specific as in, you know, everyone has a different role to play. And almost kind of like if you just have a bunch of agitators, a bunch of educators, and no legislators, you kind of end up only being able to to reach the particular group of crowd that you that you can, the, the people that you can. Um, the legislator, just like William Wilberforce is more known, reaches a far greater number of people. Right. Um, Charles Sumner has probably ha- has more monuments, more things written about him. He's better known. He's got this legacy, and he's generally well liked. Where William Lloyd Garrison is a smaller number of people. And, you know, because of who he was and what he had to do, mm-hmm. um, just or like Thomas Clarkson. Lincoln versus William Lloyd Garrison. It's like everyone right. thinks of Lincoln when they think of abolition. Right. You know? mm-hmm. and, it, and it makes those of us who know kind of like, oh, you know, he's the great <laughs> emancipator. And you're like, well, you know, mm-hmm. but yeah. it but it is a it's a proper thing. Um, but when we speak about the role of the legislator, we are talking about a very in, in the American context, a very necessary yeah. component. Like if the abolitionist movement had been doing what we've been doing for now nine or so years and we hadn't yet gained any legislators, right. we could say that our, our agitation is not bearing fruit. But because legislators are actually beginning to pick up bills of abolition Um, All over the place. All over the place because candidates are starting to adopt abolitionism and running on it as a political platform and because there are debates going on in the legislatures in various state houses and senates, this is fruit. 
Yeah. A lot of time people go like, man, is there, are we bearing any fruit by doing all this stuff on Facebook or on YouTube and Twitter? I mean, are we, what is this all amounting to? Well, you can judge the fruit of a movement by whether or not like a cultural movement, by whether or not it is actually having a direct impact on politics. And the way we see that first and foremost is on legis- what the legislators are doing. So right. let's talk about why that's why it's so important, why it's such an important role. So the first one's obvious. To abolish abortion, you need a bill to abolish abortion. And so yeah. obviously you've got to have the legislator to put his or her name on that yep. on that bill. And so that's just kind of the obvious one right there in the front. But there's a second reason that maybe for, for our context is just just as important. And that's the role they can play in growing the movement because they can do something that we can't do to the degree that they can, right? They can write a bill and they can, which, which forces the pro-life incrementalists to oppose that bill, right? And that's when you see lots of people come around to agreeing with the abolitionist position that they may not have agreed to previously. Because once they see that, once someone sees the pro-life leaders come against an abolition bill, everything they've been hearing from the abolitionists that they may not have believed is confirmed. Yeah. And we see this all the time too, with like bringing people along because like, I I know I've got a lot of friends who see that kind of thing and they're just like, this is outrageous that that's happening. And it is like, you need those legislators to be exposing that to the pro-lifers because a lot of the pro-lifers just don't know that when push comes to shove, to shove, their politicians are going to be siding with what's ever easiest for them oh yeah and Uh, until there's a bill of abolition yeah the politician can tell the the fanboy or whatever yeah oh i'm totally pro-life i'm gonna save all the babies and and then when the the person comes along and says well you know what'd you do and they can cite all their pro-life legislation well once you have a legislator who files a bill of abolition all of a sudden that that pro-life politician there's really something there that they Mm -hmm. can come back and say well okay how did you vote on that yeah it really separates the wheat from the chaff very, very quickly. Yeah. Whereas before you, you don't as much know where the wheat and the chaff is because there's, there's no, there's no righteous stand being taken. Yeah. It's all talk to even expose who's on what side. But then once you have that, you know, someone plant that, that flag, here's the righteous standard that I'm calling our state to. Once you have that, you see who, 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 who flocks to that standard and who rejects it. Yeah. And that's, and that's how you know. And so we've got to have the people exposing that. And for me, that was one of the crucial things that brought me around to abolitionism. I was, I was maybe 80% there, um, you know, just from, from talking to you and, uh, and to Judah Ivey and John DeClotz and a few other abolitionists. Um, but then when I, when I came to Oklahoma city for the first time and, uh, it was the, it was the Dan Fisher event uh, on January 6th at, uh, at Fairview. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I heard you on stage say, and uh, Tony Lounger of Oklahomans for Life is, is, is opposing this bill because he says it'll repeal all the pro life regulations. I didn't believe you, right? Yeah. I've, I've talked about this, uh, I think, in episode two or three, maybe. But, but that, I, I that did wouldn't not have believe you. The occasion to prove that true right. would have never been there. If Joseph Silk if had Joseph never Silk, before the yeah. bill. And, and so, yeah. like, I mean, we could probably come up with, um, you know, instance after instance of, of people having that. Yeah. I mean, people will say something like, you know, what you're saying is just, it's all well and good and looks good on a Facebook meme or something like that, but it's not really real until there's a bill, you know, like, I mean, people will say that and then you're kind of like, okay, well now there's a bill. Now, what do you think about it? And now there's 10 bills in 10 states. So where are you at now? Yeah. Like this accusation that it's really the pro-life establishment that's opposing the total and immediate abolition of abortion or, you know, delaying it or something like that can sound crazy until it's proven yep. and nothing proves it until you have a bill. So yep. it's, it's, it's been probably in all the different things, all the different projects, all the different conferences, everything. The thing that has probably convinced more people, you know, than anything. I'd like to say it was just the word of God says this, you should be an abolitionist. <laughs> Yeah, but people are like, okay, I get you, but like it's it, it was usually like I can't I, I know what you're saying, but like I just don't really believe that there are really people out there. We just got to save as many babies as we can. Yeah, and they're doing the best that they can, and I don't really believe that they're actually nefarious and going to sort of oppose abolition. You sound like a nut. Well, we'll get a guy to put a bill of abolition out there on the table, 
and you'll get your 100% hardcore pro-life, pro-life lobby approved guy to stick that thing in the table, you know, like mm-hmm. to shelve it or whatever. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's one of the big things that got it that got it going here, right? A, a lot of the pastors who are now some of the uh, some of the most active abolitionists in the mm-hmm. state of Oklahoma, they came on board when their convention came out against SB 13 in 2019. That's right. And so all these pastors are, you know, they're uh, obviously in support of abolishing abortion. And they had, they're in Oklahoma. This is Oklahoma's where the movement started. You know, you guys got it going here uh, about 10 years ago. Yeah. And so they've, they've heard abolitionist stuff before, you know, that the pro-lifers are really the ones delaying and keeping abortion legal and all this stuff. And they've, this, it wasn't that, that the abolitionist pastors who we now work with hadn't heard that they had, but it, it wasn't until they saw it with their own eyes that it, 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 it clicks and yeah. they see their own Christian convention come out against the bill. Right. And that's what really got them to, holy smokes. But those, they didn't, those abolitionists aren't crazy. They, they were really serious yeah. for what it was. But they didn't. The, the crazy thing about that is that the, the Oklahoma Baptist General Convention of Oklahoma, the formerly, Oklahoma Baptist, formerly known as BGCO, BGCO, like, I know that a lot of those guys knew about abolitionists, yeah. uh, various abolitionists, various ways in churches and city streets and wherever had been calling for immediate abolition, treat abortion as murder. Hey, we're not, we're not loving our preborn neighbors as we love ourselves, but there's kind of a sort of ability to sort of ignore them. It's like, we can talk about them sort of behind the scenes or back channels. We don't have to make public statements yeah. about these people because they're just kind of like, they're like street preachers and yeah. we don't think like, there's, there's such a minority. Yeah. But then whenever they go to the Capitol to do their, they, they've got to do their sort of lobbying round and the big bill that's really being debated is, are we going to abolish abortion? Are we going to sort of like stand up and be constitutional and nullify unjust opinions and do all this kind of stuff? They have to give a response. They can't just sort of ignore it. It's not like a guy at the edge of your parking lot holding a sign saying, love your neighbor as yourself. Like whatever you can ignore that guy. There's a long tradition of ignoring that guy, but whenever it goes from on his sign to like in the daily Oklahoman, yeah. Or the Tulsa world, that's a drop card that can't be ignored. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and praise God, the BGCO. Obviously, we're uh, you know that's that's the story of 2019. It's not the same story anymore, um, right? Right. The the leaders, uh, Blake Gideon, is now someone who who gave an endorsement of SB 13, and we are obviously extremely thankful. You had a meeting with them, a very productive one. Yeah. Um, and so we're we're very thankful that that isn't the position anymore. Um, and there's been a lot of improvement. Yeah, there. just in case someone's so, watching it and they're kind of yeah. like, well, wait, but I I'm a part of Oklahoma Baptist and we're now kind of pro yeah. like abolition, right? right? You know, so but even that that development, you know, like they first had to come into conflict with it, had to really think about it, and sure they did oppose it. Yeah. But then the next year they're like, we're not going to oppose this. We've thought about this, and yeah. you know, this is actually good. We hope this bill here a, has a hearing. Right. And so and and. and yeah. Praise God for that. You know, that's not an easy thing yeah. to, to, to come around to, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. But we, I mean, we need more, but, yeah. um, right. but that all started with just one guy, a legislator, yep. Joseph Silk deciding, and it's a story of repentance. Like all these, like abolition is just like always a story of repentance. And that's a beautiful thing. It was Joseph Silk with a heartbeat bill coming into contact, not with a bill, with a legislator, but with a political action that he could understand. And that was a petition initiative to um, put before the people of Oklahoma, you know, um, abolishing abortion as murder. And he took his heartbeat bill and he looked at it and he said, this isn't what I want. I want this. So he repents, he files it as a bill, and there's just sort of a snowball effect. Yep. And we've just gained so much ground, ground that we wouldn't have gained without him. It's, so it starts with the legislator. Or it starts, starts yep. with the bill. Yeah. It didn't start so. with the legislator. Sure. But that, yeah. that, that, that process from there. Yes. Yeah. And so the legislator, I, it's kind of like what, what's Bradley's thing. It's like the beacon. You said that Bradley Pierce has a sort of, yeah, yeah. It's a, a bill. It's the beacon that, that goes up that, uh, really is the call to bold Christians to, 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 to rally to it. Um, yeah. and yeah, it's kind of, you know, it's Got kind of a bad signal. Bat signal. It's the it. it's the bat Bible signal. believer symbol. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. It, the Bible believer signal goes up, and they're like, instead of one guy 
man, it's, it's just a bad analogy. It's like one thing goes up and everybody comes. Like, can you imagine? Like, they throw those the bat are, signal and all the, the people, bats. all the people of Gotham, <laughs> go fight the Joker or whatever. I don't know how that stuff it's works. It's not perfect. It's not perfect. I'm a it Marvel is. guy. That's nonsense. But, <laughs> but, but well, yeah, beacon in the sky. It just seemed like it fit. It does. I, the bat. <laughs> so it's like, the, but it is something that everyone sees. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of hard not to know. Like when someone puts forward a bill to criminalize abortion as murder. Yeah. It's you, you've got to be under a rock. Now, a lot of people do live under rocks, but anyone who's not living under a rock Mm -hmm. gets that. And so I think it does function that way. Yeah. I remember uh, the first time I met uh, pastor Sam catcher, who's a pastor in Wewoka, Oklahoma. Um, Mm -hmm. I was, I was doing a, a abolition day rally promo video with him. And one of the things he said was, you know, I, I'd never really heard of the abolitionist movement or anything, or, you know, I'd never, uh, you know, heard about any of the projects they were doing. Um, but I was just watching the news last year, and I see that there's a bill to completely abolish abortion. And it just clicked. Well, why are we regulating abortion? Let's, let's completely abolish abortion. Like, as, yeah. as soon as I saw it on the news, I was I was, I was was totally on board. Um, and so it really is. Just people need to see that. When you when you make that righteous stand, and then it, it becomes widely known about, bold Christians like Sam Ketcher, like Dusty Devers, like Brett Baggett, rally to it. Yeah. Um, and that's what we're seeing. And it's, it's super, super encouraging. Yeah. Um, but you, you, you gotta have a legislator taking a bold stand. Um, yep. And the people who are bold will rally to it. Yeah. And, and there's something, if you don't have a legislator, like you start, you, you lose that ability to reach quite a few people. And, and, yeah. and now in, in Oklahoma where we're based, we we're actually facing the situation where, Senator Silk has sort of run his course in the state Senate and is no longer in there. Um, but as many of you who follow our organization and this program, you, you know that we had lots of candidates running as abolitionists. It was like the first time in history um, this year, not just in Oklahoma, but also in Indiana, Alaska, and some other places where candidates were actually running sort of as abolitionists. Yeah. But in Oklahoma, you have this abolitionist movement, abolitionist voting block. And sure. I mean, I think, well, for, for the persnickety people watching, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's, you know, some of them are full blown abolitionists and some of them are on their way abolitionists or some of them are, you know, uh, for abolition and anything in between, you know, so, but there's this voting block in Oklahoma that really does want to abolish abortion. Yeah. And so we had how many, I can't even remember how many candidates we had. There were about eighteen who we who we had interest in and who we endorsed to some yeah. degree. I think there were eight who we gave a full endorsement to, and yeah. about nine or ten more who we gave qualified endorsements yeah. to. And so. and and we only gave endorsements, full endorsements, to people who filled out our survey saying they would put forward and support bills of total abolition and would reject all, and reject all, all attempts to compromise all the substitute bills. Yeah. Um, and then the qualified ones, you know, if it was somebody who's saying like, that's what I focus on, that's what I want to do, but I can't really, I'm just being honest. I may support, you know, stuff that legalizes abortion. And we're like, well, you're crazy, but like, maybe you don't want to get it and we can reach you later. Yeah. Um, cause they just think regulating abortion is somehow the best thing you can get. But we had, yeah, a good solid 10, yeah. you know, I think. And they, they ran, it's historic, but it's very hard to just sort of wake up and be like, I'll run on a very radical platform. Mm. But one of the guys, Warren Hamilton, uh, what, what all, what all of Warren Hamilton do? What, what is he, 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 he had to win his primary against yeah. how many people? Uh, they, he had two opponents, and two so, opponents, just Larry Boggs. And, uh, I can't actually remember the, the other guy's name. He, he didn't really factor in very much except to force the runoff. He only got like eight or 9%. Um, yeah. I can't remember his name, but anyway, it was, it was between him and Larry Boggs the whole time. Very close. Um, in the in the original primary on June thirtieth, Boggs actually had the lead. He yeah. won forty six to forty two, and then the rest went to the, the the guy who finished in third place. Yeah. But in the in the runoff primary on August twenty fifth, it flipped, and Warren yep. Hamilton won. Yeah. Um, and it's crazy because, like you said, he he wasn't running as a guy who was um, in support of abolition, but he was kind of running as a pro-lifer, or he was not trying to. He was trying to kind of hide the fact that he was a full abolitionist. He was running as an abolitionist of abortion. Yeah, 
It's not, it's not an attack on any of the other candidates, really. It's not. That's not why we're saying this. But yeah. if there was one candidate in Oklahoma who had most clearly identified himself as an abolitionist, I mean, maybe Carissa Robertson, equally so. Carissa, Katie. Katie Keith. Oh, Katie Keith. There were man. a couple. Yeah, see, there I'm, were a couple. I'm speaking to Alex. There, there were a couple. We we had a really strong group. Yeah, I just always look at sort of people, and they're like, Katie was in really late too. She, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but but the thing about Warren, I guess the reason I'm thinking that about Warren is that, like, I feel like I've known Warren for a couple of years. Yes. Like Warren was actively involved in the abolition campaign of Dan Fisher. Um, he was around there. He 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 was the only one of those future candidates who knew back whenever Abolition Day was happening. I'm going to run. Yeah. I'm going to run on this platform. I'm going to before this language. So he was very much upfront about it. There was nothing cloaked for a long time. Yeah. For a long time. And and this is in a, in the midst of a culture where all the sort of political expert people and consultants come along and say Water okay, it down. Yeah, you want to run for it, you just don't use the A word. Like yeah. they're all crazy, you know, and and Warren, you know, I don't know what kind of temptations he had in in that area or whatever but whatever they were and whoever told him to do that he didn't do it i mean he was very he was he associated with i mean the the abolitionist group there's a group called ecclesia of oklahoma they're um a ministry and they are abolitionists they're not pro-lifers and they were very heavily involved in his campaign and he didn't you know throw them under the bus yeah. he didn't throw free the states under the bus like whenever we endorsed him you know, he ran it. He's like, yes, I am an abolitionist candidate. I have the endorsement of the abolitionist lobby. I do not have the endorsement of the pro-life lobby. Yeah. And he won. He won. He won. He, he got into his runoff. And then when it looked like, okay, you got in the runoff, but Boggs beat you. He's, he's probably like he worked his tail off. The people in his area knew exactly what was going on. What's the difference between Larry Boggs and Warren Hamilton? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was the primary issue in the campaign was yeah. abolition versus pro life. Yeah, because on I mean, even though Boggs didn't want it to be the primary issue, yeah, he, uh, right, yeah, he worked he put hard. All kinds of money in there to keep it about everything else. He's from Texas. Yeah, <laughs> he's <laughs> trying to yeah. steal Oklahoma's yeah. water. <laughs> he <laughs> just moved here. Yeah, that was. Yeah. And I mean, he tried to make it all the other things, but at the same time, he like sent out mailers. Like I guess some pro life groups or whatever, like gave him like some Republican groups, establishment groups, they, they gave him money to send out mailers basically saying he was the pro-life candidate and Warren was not the pro-life candidate. You can't trust candidate. Warren Hamilton to fight for pre-born children. And everyone's like, this dude's <laughs> literally trying to abolish it and you're opposing him because yeah. you oppose abolition. I mean, it just yeah. blew up in his face. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's not like Boggs lost because he was bad on other issues. I mean, Boggs was pretty good on medical freedom. He was pretty good on, on the Second Amendment. He was pretty good on a number of other things, as yeah. is Warren Hamilton. But on most of the other issues, they were they were pretty similar candidates. Yeah, he looked but, good in a hat, which is really important <laughs> in Oklahoma. <laughs> yes, he did. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he. I think he. You know, he had some good spunk to him. I mean, the guy was pretty likable, right? I mean, Larry Boggs. Yeah, but uh, but he was a pro lifer. But he was a pro lifer, an and he was running against an abolitionist. And the people said, "Yeah, we're not really going for that." Yeah. So that was super important. And as, as Sam alluded to earlier, Warren was way outfunded. Uh, if you count the money that Boggs oh, campaign, the you know the Boggs campaign had, and the money that was spent in support of the Boggs campaign, he had Warren outspent four to one. It was about two hundred thousand to about fifty thousand. Where yeah. it wasn't even close. And the but the voters yeah. knew Warren yeah. had enough to get hit, to get the word out, and that's all he needed. He needed the voters to know, I will abolish abortion. Boggs will regulate abortion. Yeah. yeah. And so and, that's what the voters knew. And some of those, some of those people in that district reported getting anti-Warren stuff every day oh, yeah. leading up to the election. <laughs> like they were putting in mailers every single day to people. Yeah, they still yeah. won. I like to think that like a sort of backfiring thing had happened where we had drawn a line between abolition and pro-lifer. Abolition meaning criminalize abortion for reals, mm -hmm. and pro-life meaning regulate it, keep it around, and oppose abolition. And then. Boggs and his people call everybody up and send him stuff in the mail saying he's super pro life. And they're like, then he doesn't have my vote. You know, like, I mean, that's how it ended up working out. Like, yeah. I mean, that I think, and the way that that all played out, I think was just so surprising because, yeah, 200,000 to 50,000 
yeah. is pretty unheard of that the that the person with fifty thousand wins. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's also endorsements to like the endor. I mean, we're talking about if you are a pro life hero in Oklahoma or a leader in the Republican establishment, you like went out of your way mm-hmm. to endorse Larry Boggs. Yeah, it's really it really seems like a outworking of that. I mean, with Garrison you look at what he was saying about politics and he seems just, he's very anti-politics in general as far as like just engagement and us voting for the mainstream candidates and yeah. stuff like that. But then when he talks about what we're trying to achieve politically, it's like getting everyone to vote as if they're abolitionists type thing. It's like, yeah. it's not a matter of um, no political engagement. It's, it's that our political options are going to change and voters are going to vote differently when abolitionism has seeped into the culture to such a degree. Yeah. Um, and that's what happened this election. It's like yeah. it had seeped in enough so that people yeah. were influenced. In that particular area. And, you know, we almost have to thank, you know, in the providence of God, you got to thank Larry Boggs yeah. for being the kind of candidate who he believed the political experts. Like they came along and said, no, 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 you've you, you got to be just just say you're more pro-life. Like, man, uh, 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 an endorsement from Oklahomans for life is going to get you over the hill. <laughs> mm-hmm. And. You know, and no one's going to know that that makes, you know, a good percentage of people throw up in the back of their mouth. Mm -hmm. But like he believed like, yeah, Oklahoma's for life, pro-life. This is the language I should use. And it it failed. And so I think that's one way that we can see some fruit for the abolitionist movement in Oklahoma and also encourage just candidates in other areas or people doing things like this to not be scared of drawing that line. And so, yeah, he's he's now he's passed the primary. He's now in the general election against the 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 Democrat Jerry Donathan. Now he's against an outright pro-abortion candidate. Yeah, um, and this and, guy's really on record as being pro-abortion. He's not in yeah. Oklahoma. You have pro-life Democrats, right? But this guy's an abortion rights yep. advocate Democrat. Yep, yep. Um, and so they're they're facing off. It's uh, it, it it might be a close race. Um, and so we do need people. Um, if you haven't heard much about Hamilton, you know, to check it out, uh, vote for mm-hmm. Hamilton 2020, vote for Hamilton 2020.com. Anyway, whatever it is, we'll have it here <laughs> for you. Yeah. Um, check well, it out. Stop doing that. It adds, adds time to my editing. Check it in post and <laughs> Sam will put it right here. Yeah. 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 So anyway, yeah, g- go to Warren's website and, and be in prayer for him. Um, it really is an important race. Yeah. And um, yeah, we, we, we need him. And all that stuff we, we talked about early, early on, Warren Hamilton is the guy we need in there to do this. Now, there are others. It's not like if he loses to Jerry Donathan, it's all over, and, you know, we're going to mm-hmm. just just go home. There's nothing else we can do. You know, there are other people. There's people like Margie Alfonso, people like Ben Jan yeah. Liu. There, there are other people, right? But Warren is the guy who's been with us for a long time, who we really know, who we know we can trust, yeah. um, who's running as an out-and-out abolitionist, and it would be really, really good to have him in the state Senate. Yeah, I mean, if, if Warren – I mean – this is what I when I say that the most important election for the abolitionist movement uh, in the coming week is this <laughs> small state senate race. It really is because no if Warren Hamilton wins and he's in the Senate, the guarantee is we've got another state filed bill of total and immediate abolition, one that we and other organizations that are abolitionist can get behind rally people to, and that will in turn cause the need and, you know, of other groups like Oklahoma Baptist and so on and so forth to weigh in yep. to see what they're going to do, where they're at on the whole thing. Get just, just people across the state aware. Okay. We have this abolition act again. Um, we're, we're told every year that, Oh, we're not going to do Senate bill 13. We're not going to do the abolition act. We're going to do this other thing, you know? So uh, Senator Bullard's bill, uh, his Senate bill that they decided to go with instead of Senate Bill 13 was the best that we could do, and it's going to save all these babies and blah, blah, blah. Well, here Thousands we are. Thousands of babies. Thousands, yeah. Thousands. Yeah, 5,000 babies are aborted in Oklahoma every year, but this yeah. was going to save thousands of them. And, of course, next year will come along, and we'll see how they try to lie again. We Rather than lie, we'd hope they repent and get behind this bill. But with Warren winning, we know that it's going to be a solid bill of abolition. Yep. Now, even if you disagree with, with Warren on some other issue, with Warren, the commitment to run that bill is solid, and we can get behind that bill and his running it. 
Yeah. So it's hugely important. So, I mean, if you're, if you're praying daily about political stuff, this is what you need to be just really like besieging heaven um, for. And um, so, so really you're listening to this. I mean, these guys, I mean, we're recording this podcast on the day that Amy Coney Barrett was, you know, approved to the Supreme court. Uh, pretty much the entire news, like all the news stations, all of the pro-life pages, it's all about that. It's all about Trump versus Biden. And it, you know, the end of civilization as we know it and the rise of socialism and all this kind of stuff. And here we are for about the last 45 minutes talking about the importance of getting Warren Hamilton in the state Senate. Oklahoma Senate District 7. But I tell you the truth (laughs) as someone who not only studied past abolitionist movements, but as super involved in this abolitionist movement, the single most important political race that is occurring in the country today is actually the Senate race between Warren Hamilton and his Democratic challenger, which I don't even know their name. Donathan. Jerry Donathan. Jerry Donathan. Jerry Donathan. We do know their names because we are a political. Yeah, we're professional. <laughs> the guy that likes freaking child sacrifice and believes it should be legal. That yeah. guy, which... I mean, Callie, we, we need you praying like crazy for Warren. Yeah. Yeah. Jerry mean, Jonathan gave a despicable defense of abortion that is just the mainstream pro-abortion position. So this guy yeah. is like out and out terrible. Yeah, and, and, and we haven't made a huge deal out of it on the show, but I mean, there are people who, because they are so opposed to abolition, are going to be voting for this pro-abortion candidate. Even yeah. though they're... Republicans, yeah. Republican yeah. pro-lifers, and I we know that the Senate majority prefers that. Like they would rather yeah. have Jerry Donathan in than Warren Hamilton. It's insane because when they look at it, having one more Democrat in the state Senate is easy to deal with. Mm-hmm. Having someone who's going to be in there, like proving the lie that is the pro-life position, is a problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I mean, if Greg Treat could vote in that district, it's going to be for the Democrat. Pro abort. Probably. 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 Put it on the screen. <laughs> Everything he's done in stop, the history of the world. Prompting graphics right put here. the graphic here, probably, <laughs> and then scratch it out and put but we'd freaking know that Greg Treat would vote for the pro abort. Yeah. But we hope he repents. But okay. my goodness. I mean it's yeah. it is very clear yeah. that the establishment doesn't want Warren Hamilton in there and would actually prefer the pro child sacrifice guy. Yeah. yeah. And so being up against all that, Warren has overcome that once, right? You know, as, as you alluded to earlier, he had, he had the congressman, he had Mark Wayne Mullen, he had, I think he had both U.S. senators. I think he had Langford's endorsement and Inhofe's endorsement. He had everyone, every, every yeah. one in Oklahoma City and their mother endorsed Larry Boggs. Yeah, I think the governor. And their money. The governor, Kevin State endorsed Larry Big Boggs. Big pro-life yeah. governor. And vo- and, I mean, like, why is it, did, the, did this guy go through, did Kevin Stitt go through and make endorsements in each Senate race? That, yeah. Only the ones where they're like, we've got to keep abolitionists out of there because if an abolitionist is in there, we're going to have this bill and we're going to have thousands of people yeah. emailing us every day, which by the way, we can probably announce on this show that there's going to be abolition day, yep. regardless of whether there's a bill. It's easier when there's a bill, but there's going to be an abolition day at the Oklahoma State Capitol on February 9th, 2021. And on February 9th, 2021, Warren Hamilton will no doubt be a part of that and hopefully as a senator. So this is extreme. That's why I'm saying it's the most important. It's more important than the presidential election, which people just don't understand the way politics works. So the way that culture works and the way these things all sort of have an effect but we need Warren in there to be a champion of the cause of abolition, put forward that bill, and give the people of Oklahoma the chance to rally to it, and the other legislators now, you know, a chance a f- to repent. Yeah, a few years into it, because yeah. I mean, we may clown on Treat and McCourtney and all those guys, and previous guys who've fallen away because of like Smalley and so on and so forth. But really, we don't know how the presidential thing is going to turn out, but. Yeah. Let's say Biden wins and we've got a Biden Harris administration and we've got the state of Oklahoma. Like, why not stand up and abolish abortion mm-hmm. in the face of the feds? Yeah. They and didn't do it when they had Trump's help. Yeah. And, and a big covering thing, I think pro lifers just think about it all wrong, too. It's like, because they, when they see a run like Hamilton and they think, and, and you know, some abolitionists think about it wrong as well, but when Hamilton makes it about abolition, 
whether he wins or loses, we are achieving exactly what we want. We are pushing the paradigm. So yep. it's like we, we'd show up on college campuses sometimes and we get these students for life groups who don't really do anything but cupcakes and, you know, baby yep. socks and stuff. <laughs> um, they, they'd come up to us and be like, well, you shouldn't do this. It's not, it's not good that you're doing this. And look how this person's reacting and look how that person's reacting yep. whenever someone gets angry. It's like that person is angry and they're convicted because they're seeing child sacrifice in front of them. And they're responding to yeah, it. Yeah, you're reminding like, them of what they did. Yeah. The cupcake's yeah. not doing that. And I am perfectly satisfied to see them have an angry reaction because I know that something is happening in their heart, and I'm going to actually try to preach the gospel to this person, but you would prefer that nothing happens in their heart and they just like you more. And so it's like the mm-hmm. the desired effect of what we're trying to do with pushing you know, legislators through, whether they make it or not, is pushing the paradigm. That's what we're trying to That's do. That's right. And ultimately and, has the greater effect. Yeah. Because you're not like a, the garrison quote that you kind of alluded to earlier. It's like, well, he always expected to see abolition at the ballot box, mm-hmm. but it wasn't by getting just people to go and vote. That That's just easy. It's, it's, it's getting the person to go and not to chuck their principles mm-hmm. and go and vote as an abolitionist, not to get abolitionists to just go vote for anyone. Mm-hmm. So if you switch, you shift the paradigm, and you create, you create, you know, all these people who come to this decision is like, listen, I really want to get behind an abolitionist and you get an abolitionist running. Mm-hmm. Then you've got the situation where you actually yeah. gain ground. So even if you lost like Dan Fisher, he lost, but he won. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like people need to know that yeah. these other abolitionist candidates, they lost and Katie Keith, she lost, but she won. Yeah. I don't know how many people she won. She lost Paul Scott his seat, so that's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. And people don't understand sometimes whenever an abolitionist gets out there and pushes the paradigm and then loses, there's always people that come along and say, man, if maybe he didn't push the paradigm so much, you wouldn't have lost. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, Dan, maybe you would have uh, beat the multimillionaires that you were running against if you didn't make such a big deal out of the fact that you were an abolitionist and they were bad Mm pro-lifers. And they say this thing, and they're just trying to figure out a way to – rationalize why the guy they liked lost get in his head and make him doubt his platform but it's just not true i mean dan won i mean yes he lost his campaign he's not the governor but that guy won so many converts yeah to maybe to abolition but also just to like listening and kind of getting in the pipeline and the same could be said for any of these abolitionist candidates that ran this last time around yep katie heath carissa roberson Bryce Chafin. Oh yeah, they yeah. may they may look back on it and be like, "Oh man, that was kind of, I wasted a little." You didn't waste anything. Yep. Because and and, so, and maybe you won, but you haven't really won yet. Someone who voted for you and then you lost, and they're kind of like, "Oh man, I don't really know if that's gonna. What did I do? Did I throw away my vote? Should I have voted for someone else?" And then they're gonna be paying attention, and forever they're gonna have the categories in their minds: pro life and abolition, and they're gonna pay attention to what yep. the legislators do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's a major win. Yeah, there's a there's a, uh, a book written by a kind of a a hater of yours for for oh, a yeah. long time. <laughs> and I remember. Hater. No, he said he said beautiful things about. It. <laughs> he hopes it's edifying to you. Yeah, we should say his name because people are gonna be wondering what's the guy's yeah, name. Scott Maherin. So yeah. he, he we he, talked about him on here before, right? Yeah, just briefly. When I like to bring up comments from the book that are just really yeah. really hypercritical of you. Yeah, I but think it's funny so <laughs> yeah but anyway the, when, what a great guy when when, when, <laughs> when i when i picked up that book the chapter i actually i haven't read the whole thing but i did read the chapter on dan fisher and he he read i read the whole thing every night <laughs> <laughs> it takes seven and a half minutes it's it's a great work that really stays with you i think yeah, yeah. my kids love it anyway, go ahead <laughs> anyway yeah he 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 frames this thing as if as if well, you know like, like you said i mean dan fisher did not win he's not governor and so this guy maharin frames it as just this horrible loss and it was all because of you oh and you, yeah and yeah and dan fisher he did not win he he finished in fourth place he finished with about was it eight and a half percent and then yeah, the, and 36 the, thousand votes right and and the winner finished with uh with 26 and then i think Stitt finished in second with 24 or something like that so anyway he mm-hmm. he, he didn't win and he finished fourth, so it's not like he was third. He was fourth, but he was fourth out of eight, and he finished higher than people who had five out times of ten. out of ten. Yeah, and he he finished higher than guys who had six, seven times as much money. Yeah, it was a Fisher similar situation. Did. I mean, he. So if you look at like Gary, dollar per vote, he. Oh yeah, him out of the water. If it was yeah. dollar per vote, like if you like, oh yeah, but 
you won the electoral college, but we won the dollar per vote. I mean, we <laughs> killed it on the dollar per vote. Like, mm-hmm. like I can't remember what it was. Like, you know, Stitt's like spending seventy dollars a vote, and we're spending it's like, like eight three. times more. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and so it, and it's the same thing. Like the Gary Richardson campaign spent millions of dollars. Dan Fisher just a couple hundred thousand. Boom, we killed. Richardson to the point that some of the Richardson people don't like us to this day. They like hate abolition because we, we ruined his chances. But yeah, I mean, for whenever someone like uh, Scotty, whatever, Scott Marin. Yeah. Whenever someone says like, Oh, he, Dan would have won. It's like, no, Dan. I mean, I love Dan, but he probably wouldn't have done as well. I mean, the 36,000 votes that he got were people that were like, I like this guy. I like him on the black robe and all that kind of stuff, but I like him on total abolition. Yeah. It was the distinguishing feature between him and everyone else. I remember mm-hmm. I was in Ohio at the time, and I had kind of, in my move from Washington State to Ohio, I came through Oklahoma City, and I met, I met you for the first, or no, I met you for the second time, and I met Dan yeah. Fisher for the first time. Right. And so I was kind of watching that race from afar, and so I remember reading an article, I think it was like the day or two days before the ele- before the primary, and I remember reading, the art, the, the the author, I think it was, I forget it was the Oklahoma or Tulsa World, something like that. Mm-hmm. But they were like, Dan Fisher is going to stun people, right? He was just a, he's a state candidate. He didn't have any money, so we're just all assuming yeah. he's going to finish with you know half a percent. But Dan Fisher is going to finish ahead of most of these guys. Yep. And he's going to shock a lot of people. And I remember reading that, and I was, man, praise God. Yeah. <laughs> man, he's, he, I mean, we we pretty much knew he he wasn't going to be the next governor. Yeah. But he finished stunningly high. And now I moved to Oklahoma about about a year and a half ago, and when I move here and I talk to people who are here, how did you hear about abolitionism, or how did you, uh, how yeah. did you come to join the movement? Well, I got connected with with the, with the Dan Fisher campaign, right? Yeah. Um, uh, I think Warren Hamilton. The first time you would have connected with Warren Hamilton, Dan, the Dan Fisher, Fisher campaign. campaign. First time you could, first through time a loser. <laughs> We so won we, all these people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and same with Margie. I remember calling Margie Alfonso, the uh, the uh, the candidate for House District seventy nine, who has promised to put forward a bill of abolition. And I remember talking to her on the phone when we were when we were talking to candidates. Mm-hmm. And she was like, "Yeah, I remember. I had no idea that the pro life groups were were opposing abolition until I I heard a, a Dan Fisher commercial come on the radio. And yeah. now and, and now she's on board with with abolishing abortion. And it's the Dan yep. Fisher campaign, which lost. It did that. Yeah, somebody so, gave money to Dan Fisher and said, "Man, did I waste my money?" No, you didn't. Yeah. Like you don't know it, but like there's a there's someone who ran for house and won her primary and is going to get in there possibly through the general, who is going to put forward a bill of abolition because she heard the commercial that you paid for. Yeah. That you thought was a loss. Yeah. It was a big win. Yeah. So I mean that I think I think people need to grasp that, yeah. and and I think some other abolitionists in other states that may be looking at Oklahoma, you know, kind of as a sort of maybe model for what they should do, or maybe like it's a model anti model, like they're kind of like ah maybe I want to do it like Oklahoma but a little different or something. You got to understand that like we've been going at it over and over in all these areas, and even when we don't completely succeed, we succeed as a result, like mm-hmm. along the way. Yeah. There's a reason thousands of people show up at the state house when we have the abolition bill. Yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> and that's hard to do on a Tuesday and it's cold outside. Like really oh, hard yeah. to do to get thousands of people to show up. When Satan has every weatherman saying it's terrible outside. Yeah. And you know, I, I talked to some people who are like, yeah, I was actually on my way and I turned around. Mm. I'm like, well, Good for you. <laughs> I don't know what I say to him, but I'm no, gonna I, draw. I, I'm gonna draw a picture. Of yeah, you. I'm gonna draw a picture of you in your car turning around. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but if you come next week, next year, I'll put, put you on the a devil horse. Devil on your shoulder, pulling at the wheel. Oh man, that's not, I'm gonna make a note of that. But no, I was in San Antonio um, like a weekend ago, like last weekend, and uh, yeah, it was like a, it was a, you know, small gathering, you know, 60, 80 people, and uh, you know. In my talk, I said, you know, you know, small beginnings are you shouldn't frown on these. And this is really good. You know, you have more people here than you had last year. And really, this is really important. I was trying to encourage them. And uh, after the talk, I'm like, you know, having some coffee and I'm talking to a lady there. And she she basically she was just talking. I was like, yeah, I think we had, you know, maybe three, four thousand at Abolition Day in Oklahoma. And she's just like, you know, because she's sitting there thinking, you told us to be happy about 80 and you're talking about yet. Yeah, 4,000 at your abolition day. And I was like, you know, I kind of had to tell her, it's like, well, it's because we have all these things all the time, 
all these losing battles all the time, you know, if we, yeah. to reframe it in what we're saying. I mean, we, we had the Dan Fisher thing. We had the 2016 AAOK thing. There's incredible amounts of motivation for people behind it because they know that one victory, like one true victory for us is it in Oklahoma. It's like justice is established. Babies yep. are not being murdered. It's criminalized. It's done. Yep. Like that's, that's the motivation behind it. It's not like, oh, a heartbeat bill is passed. Now that happened. Yep. Like, w- why did we fight for all that time? Nothing happened. With this, they know the victory is the victory. It's yep. what we want. Yeah, and getting more and more people to get that and to show up and support it and it alone mm-hmm. is is victory all along the way. I mean, thank God for guys like Warren Hamilton who stick their necks out and say, I'm going to run for public office. And at the same time, I'm going to do something to help a movement, not just try to get elected. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, he's not just, I mean, because I think everyone says to get elected, you know, talk less, smile more sort mm-hmm. of thing. And, uh, you know, don't really be edgy. And he's like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to contrast myself with the other pro-life Republicans by saying that they're just keeping abortion legal. Yeah, Don't do that. You know, like he's like willing to yes, run to win because he doesn't want to just educate and just convert people. He does want to win. And he is winning. And is winning, but at the same time, willing to further the cause by bringing people into the cause of abolition. So in the event that he doesn't win, his area of the world is further along. And so that's just like hugely important. I think it takes a lot of uh, understanding on his part, a lot of courage and, you know, faith in God and that God's, you know, with the movement. And so, yeah, I mean... Hats off to him. Let's do everything in our power to pray for him, to support him, yeah. um, to it, raise awareness for people. You don't have to be from Oklahoma to support him. Yeah, and if you know anyone in McAllister or Stigler or Wilburton, you kind of southeast Eufaula area, if you know people there, tell them about yeah. Warren Hamilton's campaign. Send them a link to, to Warren Hamilton's website. Yeah. Um, you know, it, on the off chance that you have friends yeah. who have friends in Oklahoma. On the off chance that you have friends of friends, not that, that you have friends. Yeah, on the off chance that you're <laughs> not like, you have friends. <laughs> on the off chance. Well, see, I, A lot of people who watch this show, maybe they don't have any friends. Yeah, I'm imposing my <laughs> own feelings on people. On the off chance that you're among the people who have friends. No. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, just on the on the off chance that you have some friends in Oklahoma and you don't even know where they're at or whatever, yeah. you, you, it would be good to go to Warren Hamilton's Facebook page. Like some stuff, share some stuff, go to his website, support the guy, and try to get other people aware of him. Because, you know, there could there's a lot of people that are just going to go to the polls to vote for who they like for president. And they're going to look at the names underneath it, and they're not going to really know. We need them to vote for Warren Hamilton. Mm-hmm. So everybody who's watching this, if you're voting for Biden, vote for Warren Hamilton. If you're voting for Trump, vote for Warren Hamilton. It's, it's Warren Hamilton. Yeah. Warren Hamilton all the way down. Very, very important. So, yeah, go ahead and give him some some love, some likes, some shares. Go to his website. See what you can do to support him and support him, most importantly, um, just by lifting him up to God, you know, asking that God would uh, bless his campaign, give him strength. Now, I know his wife, she's like, she's an abolitionist too. There's some people like their husbands go off and they do this stuff and they're like, oh, my gosh, she's right there with him. Yeah. So, yeah. um, Sherry, you know, is great. And so she's, she's, she's in the trenches with him too, but you know, just pray that they're dealing with this because yeah. who knows what kind of demonic attacks and everything in between demonic attacks and facing off with Democrats is happening there in the Hamilton household. So be praying for them. Yeah. Um, of course, there's also other campaigns, candidates that we need to be praying for. Um, looking at John Jacob in Indiana House District 93. Um, what's his race like? Uh, he's white. <laughs> what is his? Yes, he's white. You know, usually that wouldn't really be a relevant. It shouldn't be a relevant thing. Well, but that's yes. what his race is like. John Jacob, whose race is like white. Yeah. <laughs> he's a Caucasian, uh, is yeah. running against probably a Caucasian. And we were talking, it's Indiana. Yeah. Um, well, we know what's that he's, he, what's it shaping up as? He's probably got some good enthusiasm behind him because he took out an incumbent. That's hard to do. Um, yes. Yeah. So there's yeah. already a lot of enthusiasm with the base, I would imagine. Yep. Is a Republican area. 
It's yeah. that that area is usually gone Republican. It we looked a, at it. Yeah, it was a slightly like the incumbent was a Republican, and so he's kind of like the Warren Hamilton kind of same deal in, in, in Indiana. Indiana. He knocked off the incumbent Republican, so now he's facing the Democrat challenger. Um, and yeah. so yeah, it is. A, I think, but the, it was a close race between the Republican and the Democrat last time. So it, it, it is probably going to be a close race. So be in prayer for him as well. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Really, anything and everything good we've said about Warren Hamilton applies to John Jacob. Apply, yeah. Applies to John yeah. Jacob. Yeah, and that could be. I mean, this is just, um, I'm not sure if it's the case, but it could be that the reason she got knocked off is because she's more of a moderate, and the reason it was closer is because she's more of a moderate, so could be. people didn't want to vote for her as much, but I don't now, know. Now, he, in his race, it didn't come down so, uh, it wasn't so r- radically, you know, charged abolitionist versus pro-lifer. They weren't coming to blows. He and his opponent weren't there was actually to beat each other up. There was no <laughs> physical, like, there was no, like, let's go outside. Sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. Meet me outside, Daniel. <laughs> Let me fight your supporters. You know, I mean, yeah. it wasn't anything like that. Yeah, we're referring to stuff that actually did happen. Yeah, in the Boggs Hamilton race, but all coming from Boggs. Ha- Hamilton, yeah, Hamilton. Hamilton, Hamilton was all class, but Boggs was. Yeah, Hamilton was like, meet uh, me outside. Let's not do the whole meeting me outside. <laughs> Is there any way we can get this candidate to chill? Yeah. Um, but but John Jacob, like Hamilton, did run. I mean, his material said he was going to be seeking the abolition of abortion. Yep. Like, just to tie it back to the beginning, we are, uh, you know, this is very important. Legislators play an extremely important role in uh, in what we're doing. These mm-hmm. guys are uh, well-spoken abolitionists, and they'll be able to advance the cause effectively, um, and they'll be able to bring a lot of people on board, both in their runs and in their um, ad- advocacy in the state houses. So definitely be praying for them. Yeah, and do everything you can to support them. Please leave this podcast and go to their websites. Look at their platforms and see how you can support them. Now, on to the drawing. All right, so, yes, to conclude the episode, uh, we we still have a drawing drawing to do. Yep, the drawing for a drawing. And, uh, yeah, I think it's it's kind of a heavy responsibility being the one to pull that name out of there. Yeah. Especially for this nice Aborton the Dragon piece. Um, so I think you're going to do the honors this week because Sweet. Sam, or because Jay, James, James did it last week. So I'll, I'll do some mixing. Here we go. Get some sound effects in on that. Okay. All right. Let me, let me really turn it over here. Sounds good. Oh, let me get this one back in there. All right, James, do you, do you want to shake it or bless it or? <laughs> big winner. The big winner. Pronounce their names right. <laughs> Osvaldo Rivera. Osvaldo. Took I'm, me a second. I make I make a, a joke about pronouncing a name right, and you're like, wow, this one's actually pretty tough. What is it? <laughs> Osvaldo. Sweet. Osvaldo Rivera. It doesn't say where he's from. We must not have had that info on that one. We don't have the information. I'm sure that we have in our database information as to where you're from. Mm -hmm. You're the winner, my friend, and we will be sending this to you this week. Thank you for supporting Free the States. Uh, Everybody else, we know that you support us because you really like what we do and you want to make it possible for us to do more. Um, And you're not just doing it for the art. But, uh, Osvaldo, if you were doing it for the art, (laughs) keep supporting us (laughs) Um, because we do need that money to continue to produce stuff, continue to, you know, eat, feed our families, keep the lights on, and also just get ready for the upcoming legislative session so we can support the bills of abolition and raise awareness for it. So thank you for supporting us. For those of y'all who want to support us more. uh, Freethestates.org. Yeah, the states.org. Yep, there's a big slash donate. Yep. Slash donate. Do we still have a donate and a join button, or do we just... Just use the donate button. You, yeah. Use the donate button. Any amount monthly is super helpful, and we will count you among the blessed members of our drawing, drawing bowl. Yes. All right. <laughs> so okay. Yeah. Be, be in prayer for uh, for John Jacob, for Marjorie yeah. Alfonso, for Warren Hamilton. Definitely. Um, and... They're just kind of the abolitionist newcomers who are running, but there are a lot of uh, abolition bill sponsors who have been in there for multiple sessions yeah. um, in Washington, in Idaho, in Indiana, guys like Kurt and Isley. There are a lot of others as well, so be in prayer for them. Yeah. Be in prayer for the movement. 
the abolition of abortion. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, you know, while we're, you know, while we're saying support us, um, you know, follow these candidates, get on their websites, see what they need. They're in hotly contested races. They've got to buy things. They've got to th- do things. And we just, we know we love them. We pray for them. We try to promote them in as much as we can, but we need y'all to do the same. So, so see you all, all right. next week.